This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. Get access to my streaming video service Nebula when you sign up for CuriosityStream using the link in the video description. Today, the embargo lifts on the announcement of Intel's 11th Gen Core processors, or Rocket Lake S. We do have some samples inbound, and we'll be doing some testing compared to 10th Gen and some recent Ryzen stuff and things like that. But today, we're just talking about what streamers need to know about the announcement itself and the specs that we have been given so far. Supposedly, the 11th Gen processors are going to be the last generation of the 14 nanometer plus 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 main desktop SKUs. There will potentially be some 14 nanometer inclusions in the next generation, but ideally in terms of the main launches, 11th gen is it. So theoretically, if you're waiting on that to be over, you still gotta keep waiting. But there are some updated features coming here that may make them desirable for gamers looking to upgrade right now, as that is always a market that exists. In terms of what Intel is actually claiming with this launch, Intel is claiming up to a 19% IPC or instructions per cycle improvement with these new CPUs over previous generations, with IPC kind of being the big focus here, as we'll talk about in a moment. They're also claiming up to 50% better iGPU or the integrated graphics processor performance with the new Gen 12 graphics from the new XE line or Z line from Intel that are being included on these CPUs. And then there's a big focus on that GPU accelerated AI for Intel's deep learning boost uh, that kind of skews a lot of their benchmarking when it comes to streamers and content creators, which is kind of why I wanted to make this video because there, there's some weird stuff going on in their announcement. So those were Intel's big vague claims, but in terms of spec updates that actually matter to you, we are now getting PCIe 4.0 uh, from the CPU with four more CPU lanes on these new processors with supported chipsets and motherboards. So you get up to 20 CPU PCIe lanes versus 16 going back to history with Intel CPUs, which is pretty nice. It allows you more access for capture cards, high-speed storage arrays, things like that that run directly to the CPU and higher speeds with them being Gen 4 as well, uh, which is pretty nice because like I said, previously it's all been 16 lanes to the CPU and then the rest of the chipset, which has caused some problems with some of the newer capture cards and things like that for some users, as well as, you know, NVMe RAID arrays and things like that. So for streamers and content creators, this can be pretty important. It is also worth noting, however, that the chipset or the DMI, the extra PCIe slots that you get, the, the lanes that are run through those, are still PCIe 3.0, so you will get different speeds of PCIe bandwidth based on what slot you're using, but the DMI now uses eight lanes. It's an X8 DMI, which means there is a little bit of an, of an advantage there in terms of the actual throughput that you can get with it, even if it's still Gen 3. The new CPUs and motherboards now get faster memory support out of box with DDR4 3200 supported out of the box with lots of memory overclocking upgrades. We're gonna talk a little bit about that even though that's not kinda the things I focus on later in the video. Memory speed is important for certain applications, especially when it comes to streaming or video content creation, when it comes to sharing the textures of say a game you're running or a capture card you're decoding on your GPU across the memory bandwidth back to the CPU to encode it or back to another GPU to encode it and things like that. So that is pretty neat. We're also getting we do get more 20 gigabit per second USB 3.2 Gen 2x2 ports on the 500 series chipsets, as well as discrete Thunderbolt 4 integration, which I am very, very excited for. This won't necessarily be on the more budget-oriented motherboards from this new lineup, but it will be on the Z500 motherboards for sure. More high-speed USB ports means we get more standardization of the higher-speed ports in the first place, which means we'll get more devices that actually use them, because currently everything is still stuck on 5 gigabit per second USB 3, but it also means you have more ports available for higher bandwidth devices, such as capture cards, webcams, um, storage arrays, monitors that could potentially run off it, things like that. And Thunderbolt 4 opens up a wide world of possibilities, assume we, assuming we get proper integration on desktop from this, which is seemingly what we're expecting. HEVC encode and decode is available on the iGPU, and there is AV1 decode support in 10-bit as well on the iGPU, which is pretty cool. No AV1 encode support just yet, but it'll be a couple generations before we get there, as I've said a few times. This is advantageous because if you're hoping to do local recording with HEVC for higher efficiency or higher quality recordings without sacrificing performance, or you're just looking to play back AV1 videos from Twitch in the future or on YouTube now and things like that, the new CPUs will do this. Uh, the new CPUs also support resizable bar, which has been a big deal lately, which doesn't necessarily always increase performance, but it's something that has been a hot topic that everyone's trying to make sure they introduce now, so that's pretty cool. You get the new Wi-Fi 6E support, so Wi-Fi is not being held back here, although... I'm a wired network guy myself, 
And then some, there, you do get some backwards and forwards compatibility with 10th gen CPUs on the newer ch chipsets and these CPUs on older chipsets. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Today's video was probably one of many you saw releasing at the same time after embargo lifted, trying to get views early on a topic. Rushing for timing can get frustrating. That's why I partnered with some of my creator friends to build our own platform where we don't have to worry about that stuff. My videos are higher quality there, ad free, and often extended from the YouTube versions. The site is called Nebula and we've partnered with CuriosityStream. It features YouTube's top education creators such as Legal Eagle, Thomas Frank, and Low Spec Gamer. CuriosityStream saw what we were doing for educational content content and wanted to partner up. We've worked out a deal where if you sign up with the link below, you not only get access to Curiosity Stream and their library of thousands of educational documentary content, but you got access to Nebula for free for the entire duration of your subscription to Curiosity Stream. For a limited time, Curiosity Stream is offering 26% off of their annual plan, making it less than $15 per year for both Curiosity Stream and Nebula. While you're there, check out Blockchain Revolution to learn about another complicated tech topic and get up to speed. Head on over to curiositystream.com slash epos for the best deal in streaming and get access to both sites for just under $15 a year. It's crazy. Just do it. In terms of the processors actually available, uh, things have kind of shifted a little bit from last gen back towards how they were in ninth gen. So the top tier i9-11900K only has 8 cores and 16 threads now versus the 10 cores that the 10900K has. We're back at the 9900K level. Uh, it has a base clock of 3.5 gigahertz and boosts up to 5.3 gigahertz depending on how many cores are boosting and whether you use their new thermal velocity boost thing with enough cooling uh, the all core boost is 4.7 gigahertz and it has a massive well understandably massive 125 watt tdp this thing runs hot uh, there are k and kf models available the kf model does not have an igpu and pricing is 539 dollars for the k 513 dollars for the kf model so if you want to save a little bit money without the igpu or potentially give yourself some overclocking headroom without the igpu you actually get to save a little bit of money there the i7 11700k and kf base at 3.6 gigahertz and boost up to 5.0 gigahertz still have the same 125 watt tdp and sell for $399 and $374, respectively. Going down to the i5 tier, we have the 11600K, which has a base clock of 3.9 gigahertz, a boost clock of 4.9 gigahertz, and is six core 12 threads versus the eight core 16 threads of the i7 and i9 processors, but also still carries that 125 watt TDP. Sells for $262 if you want the iGPU, $237 if you don't. And one other distinction between the i5 and the i7 and i9 is the i5 has 12 megs of cache versus the 16 megs for the i7 and i9 SKUs. The i9 model dropping back down to 8 cores and 16 threads is kind of a downgrade in some ways from the 10 cores of the 10900K, but Intel claims they had to reduce the number of cores to fit everything that they wanted to on the die. They are still using the 14 nanometer node process, but they are backporting some benefits from the 10 nanometer node process to the new one. Hopefully next generation has smaller nodes. With this launch, Intel's marketing is claiming that the extra two cores that the 10900K had over the 11900K basically don't provide any benefits in gaming or media production, and that the 11900K is doing just fine without them. However, anyone who's taken a look at Puget Systems benchmarks when it comes to CPUs for Premiere or Resolve video editing performance, and probably a lot of other media applications, or has just done that work themselves, will know that more cores generally does help a fair bit. So what we're going to look at here is it's going to come down to whether the extra IPC of the newer chips makes up for performance over those missing two cores for video editing. This is the same thing for streaming, and I think for streaming, we're much less interested in the IPC. So for games specifically, the in increased instructions per cycle just means that, you know, more can be done per cycle on the cores that are there, and for games that aren't super, super multi-threaded, that's going to be very beneficial. However... For things like video editing, as I mentioned, more cores are regularly being used for all sorts of processes involved that are too much to break down here. But specifically for streaming, we don't really need that much, you know, that high of an IPC for streaming to be balanced out. You actually do need more cores to separate cores for your background processes and things like that, your game and the streaming process, be it the hooks themselves or encoding if we're looking at software-based encoding. And so if you're looking to stream and game on the same computer and use CPU encoding, we're going to take a look and compare them in the full review once that comes, but I will say that you may have a little bit of hesitation here dropping down to eight cores for that purpose. You might run into some performance problems here if you're looking to go for a higher quality, lower CPU usage preset in X264.
We are getting a big overclocking push with this Intel release as well, with a full Intel Extreme Tuning utility overhaul with a better UI, and on some compatible motherboards and memory sets, you can actually get real-time memory clocking with XDU within Windows, which means you can change those settings without booting back to BIOS and things like that, which is pretty cool. A big focus here has been memory overclocking. With support on newer motherboards and chipsets, you get Gear 2 support. Now, I'm not big into the overclocking scene, so I had to figure out, I had to, you know, inquire to them as to what this actually means. And gear one memory overclocking keeps the memory and the memory controller at the same speed, and you're kind of limited with how much you can overclock from there. Gear two keeps the controller speed set at half the memory speed, letting memory go higher in clocks, which is great for reaching new overclocking records and things like that. However, it can introduce more latency. According to Intel during our marketing call, uh, applications even in terms of like benchmarking applications and games don't necessarily see any sort of like performance penalty as a result of the higher latency but there are situations where it can so you kind of have a trade-off of the higher speeds benefiting your specific application here or higher latency i would say for streaming you don't necessarily need to really you know to reach for the stars in terms of memory speed that even just the 3200 is probably fine um and that the latency is going to hurt you a little bit more especially when it comes to CPU encoding where you're sending textures from your graphics card through memory to your CPU, that extra latency can hurt your render times and encode times. Otherwise, all of this is just for overclocking enthusiasts and overclocking records, which, whatever. One final big push that Intel is marketing with this release is a big feature of AI, which IMO has ruined any benchmarks that Intel has actually produced to market these CPUs, which you only trust, you know, first party benchmarks from the releaser of a product in the first, like you only trust them so far in the first place, but it makes things like their video editing benchmarks completely useless in determining what the speeds might actually be. So for example, with uh, the media work, they are claiming that the 11900K versus the 5950X, the 11900K has 20% faster speeds in video editing. And in this case, they're using Magic's Vegas Pro. And they're also claiming that it has 88% faster speed versus the 10900K. The catch here is that they are using the AI engine for what's called style transfer, which is kind of like you take, you know, like the style of a painting and apply it to a video. You can transfer that from one video to another. That utilizes AI stuff to make that happen. And that is being specifically accelerated on the iGPU with all of their new AI deep memory learning stuff. However, this doesn't really relate in most situations to proper video editing or real-world video editing testing. And so, none of those benchmarks of any other CPUs versus the 5900X or even their previous generations really gives us any visual or indication as to how they perform. Which is pretty disappointing and frustrating because this takes their claims that you don't need those extra two cores on the 10900K and saying, oh, you don't need those two cores or two extra cores and we're 88% faster than it anyway, or looking at the 5950X for real, saying that they're 20% faster with just using a specific accelerating workflow and not normal video editing testing. So that will be something we focus on heavily in my review once our samples get here, because that ain't cool. They did kind of the same thing with photo benchmarking as well. Uh, however, the AI stuff may actually help benefit certain applications like XSplit VCAM, which uses AI in some capacity and GPU acceleration to remove the background from your webcam image without you actually having a green screen set up. And so that may actually benefit streamers by having that extra performance there taken off of your processor or your graphics card. Could be pretty neat, but we'll have to test and see how much that actually pays off. In terms of backwards compatibility, there is some good news in that regard. Rocket Lake S CPUs are compatible with the new motherboards, which would be H510, B560, H570, and Z590, but they're also backwards compatible with Z490 and H470. However, those motherboards will require a BIOS update before you pop in the new CPUs. And so if you're buying them new, you may have to wait for listings that specifically claim they're updated for it, or try to borrow a CPU or something. Any 10th or 11th gen CPU can do memory overclocking if the board is enabled for it. So Z490 will let you do memory overclocking as well, H470 not so much. Now as I mentioned with these CPUs, we're finally getting proper PCIe Gen 4 support that was kind of mentioned last generation with the Z490 boards, and that's because some motherboards were already given the specifications from Intel to integrate PCIe 4.0 into the motherboards, but the CPUs never had support for them. And this is where the backwards compatibility is kind of cool because the Z490 boards that have PCIe 4.0 integrated can get a BIOS update 
and then you can slap in the new CPU and still use PCIe 4.0. Now it probably won't be as expanded as on the Z590 motherboards due to the extra lanes being accounted for and things like that, but that is pretty cool to see. So overall, should streamers care about the new Intel Rocket Lake S launch? Well, if, if you're looking to upgrade or big, build a new rig or whatever, you should always care about a new hardware launch to be aware of, you know, what you're working with, what you're working against, and what you should be using or not using with regards to that. But I don't know that this new generation of processors really offers anything too spectacular for streamers in mind. For content creators, either you get the, you know, the higher clocks and the faster IPC could benefit. And again, we'll be taking a look at that deeper in our benchmarking. But... I, I, I'm still going to struggle to say that most streamers, look, especially looking to do a single PC stream, I, I can't really sit here and say that you should really consider these processors over the Ryzen chips, which for the money typically provide better performance simply due to the higher core counts. Intel has kind of locked down here on fewer cores but faster clocks on IPC, which is great for a lot of things. I don't think streaming is one of those use cases. And that's worth keeping in mind. But again, I'll ha I already have the 10900K in hand as well as a i5 from that generation. And we're getting, I believe, an i5 and 11900K sent in as well for benchmarking. So get subscribed and enable notifications to keep an eye on that. But just wanted to keep you updated with what was going on. I actually got to look at this stuff, you know, when everyone else did for once. So wanted to keep you updated. Hope you enjoyed. Hit the like button if you enjoyed. Subscribe for more tech education and stream guides on the stream professor equals Fox. I'll see you next time.